a bad reception, I suppose. Thank you for being here tonight. It's your second time at the Union. It is. Yeah. This is my second, but I'm solo. I don't have Amy and Alexis now. So. No? Okay. All right. Well, let's see how it goes then. All right. Um, so, as usual, I will start off by asking a few questions, jumping around a few different areas, uh, and then we'll open it up to the floor. So, get your questions ready. I'm, I'm sure we might find one or two tonight. Um, so. Can I just be hanged at the end of this? I just feel like I should be hanged. <laughs> it's just, it's a, well, then, why, why is that? Just the look of it. It just feels like I'm on trial and it's going to go badly. Okay. So everyone look a bit friendlier. I, think that's gonna, uh, I didn't mean that. You're all very lovely. <laughs> Except for that me. one. Okay, <laughs> please. Um, so, with the success of the Avengers and the Marvel franchise in general, you must feel like your presence in film and TV has entered a new chapter. Despite this, what attachments do you still feel to what potentially defined your work before, Buffy and the related universe? Um, you can never feel the same about something you do on such a massive scale that already sort of existed as Avengers did. Um, part of the, co the, the sort of contract I made when I, when I started Avengers was that I knew that for the first time I was going to have to deal with fans who didn't get it. Um, I was actually going to become more popular and it was going to be not fun. Because Buffy fans, Firefly fans, they understand. It, it's like a, it's, there's a contract between us of the work and what it is and what they're going through. And, and you know, people are like, oh, that helped me through a dark time in my life. I'm like, why do you think I made it? <laughs> it was a dark time in my life. It was like, you know, it's, it's a very, you know, close connection. Whereas with Avengers, which is, you know, more broadly popular, that's never going to be quite the same. And uh, um, so, in a way, you know, you have, you, you can only have greater fondness for the things that, A, you created yourself, and B, were back in the day before everybody knew, so that when somebody came up to you, it was like, oh my God, you know too? You saw that? I did that. You're the guy who saw that? You know, it's like you're the only people in the world, whereas, you know, Every now and then with Avengers, there's a person who's just like, you are close to fame, I want to be close to you, and it's, you know, it's, it's different. Um, uh, that's not, it's not always the case, but I knew that it's part of it. At the same time, um, you have to, I approach everything the same way. People would say, oh, so you make a big action movie, and then you make a little something for yourself. And I'm, I'm like, no, no, this is... This is the little something for myself. It's called Avengers. It's, you know, you, you have to approach everything as though it's the only thing you're ever going to make and put your entire heart into it. Um, when people are like, you know, what little art movie are you secretly holding in your heart? When I was making Ultron, I'm like, trust me when I say, when you see this, you'll see I was trying to make a little art movie, which is actually a shitty thing to do to a studio that gives you a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you, you mentioned it there and kind of, I saw it upstairs in drinks, and you mentioned it a bit before. Um, you get so many people who come up to you and say, you know, this show changed my life, or you know, really affected me. Um, how do you actually respond to that? I mean, it's such a big thing for someone to say to you. I think in the manner of Homer Simpson, woohoo! <laughs> um, but you know, again, it's, it's, it. At first, I thought it was lovely because they got it. And, uh, and then it really was a long time before I realized that, that I was writing these things because I was trying to work out my own life and my own process, my own troubles. And not that they've gone away, but um, so that connection for me, when somebody says that, it's what I was trying to do. I was trying to do it for myself, and I didn't know that. Um, but uh, I'm not so bright. So, uh, so it's, you know, it's... It doesn't suck. Right. I can imagine. Um, now, you know, one of the reasons why so many people say such big things to you is because of the strong female leads that you've had. You know, Buffy, of course, being one of them. Um, but what is your stance on the place of women characters in the Marvel Cinematic franchise? For example, you know, Black Widow is frequently one of the only major characters left out of merchandise. Um, and it's only after a scheduled three phase of huge blockbusters that a film with the main female lead, Captain Marvel, has been announced. So, you know, what's your feeling toward stance on the place of women characters in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Well, I think they could do better. <laughs> um, and, you know, the thing is, the people I was working with, Jeremy, Kevin, uh, Kevin who runs Marvel, 
we all felt that. I mean, you know, the, the, the money guys were the people who would say, this is what we're willing to do. This is what audiences will accept. This is, you know, who are sort of entrenched in, in older thinking. And um, it's not an agenda for those guys necessarily, the way it has been for me. Um, but at the same time, you know, they were, they were sort of biding their time trying to get to a place where they could just say, yes, we're going to put this on the schedule. I'm sorry, but there it is. And um, uh, so it's, it's taking too long. But since it's taking too long across the board in the industry, I don't feel like it's a particular Marvel problem. Um, although I do hope they, they cure it very soon. I mean, that, that wasn't something that he ever held you back before. You know, Buffy, of course, broke a lot of TV ground. Um, you know, so was it difficult to put a push storyline like Willow and Tara's you know, lesbian love on TV at the time? Um, no, we did it very gradually. I'm not sure they knew that that's what it was <laughs> for some time. They're like, boy, that seems like a very intense spell they're casting. I'm like, yes. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, my voice is so loud in my ear that I... I but, um, uh, you know, again, I've always sort of approached things with the idea of, of that whoever is giving me all that money to put it on is my partner. And that, you know, I'm not, I'm not working against them. I'm trying to work with them. I'm trying to find the space between my artistic expression, their commercial needs, and my artistic expression is commercial. I want to make things that people like. I'm not trying, I'm not wearing a beret and sitting in a garret and smoking. <laughs> um, because uh, it makes me, makes my stomach hurt. But, um, uh, you know, I, I, I understand what they need and, and what they want, and I like that. And I also think with audiences, you know, I used to say, we could have made Buffy the lesbian separatist, but let's start with Vampire Slayer and, and, <laughs> and ease them into it. And, uh, you know, you, you always want to sort of get people at the edge of their comfort level. There are a lot of things that I do that, you know, people are like, whoa, that's, that's, um, that's pretty edgy. I'm like, really? I don't, it surprises me that it's not more mainstream. Um, but, uh, um, but, you know, I, I generally have taken enough steps with both the audience and the studio or network that uh, the next one is not such a trial for them. And somebody asked tonight about Willow and Tara kissing, and that was, you know, there were some eyebrows. They were like, we're gonna, we might lose some sponsors. There was a little worry about that. Um, and at that point, I did have to say, no, well, I'll draw a line here. This has to happen. But very little pushback. Um, but you have said it's very doubtful you would return for another Avengers sequel. Kind of, you were talking about you, know, you wanted to work with people who are the, the money men, etc. But still, it's very doubtful you said you return for another Avengers sequel. Is no, I, I, I want to make number five. Yeah, right. I just need one break, and I'll come back in. But so is this still your stance? Sorry? Is this still your yes, stance? Yes, yes. I've... I've I've gone off the reservation for a while. Um, it, it was five years um, that I was working on either an Avenger or Shield, and with just a little a smattering of ado in the middle. Not much ado, a little. And um, uh, and you know, it's it's there was an enormous gift they gave me. Um, they handed me several hundreds of millions of dollars and said, "Do do what you do," which is very rare, and, and I was very lucky. But at the same time. It's important to me not just to um, have my own thing and do something smaller, and, but also to create a new challenge for myself because um, I will start to repeat myself. I will start to, um, I think Steven Soderbergh, who during one of his I'm retiring moments, said, you know, I'm finding the same solutions for problems. And, and, and I found myself in, in the same way. And, and so I sort of, you know, I need to increase my vocabulary because I'm now at a place where enough people know what I do and I've done it enough that I could just sort of vaguely do that. And that is how you become old and, <laughs> and um, obsolete. And so as, as an artist, because I'm super an artist, um, <laughs> I need to sort of make it harder for myself. So I've been working on some little personal projects that I can't describe, but I can tell you that uh, they're really hard and I'm totally failing. It feels great. Um, so do you, will you have any involvement in the wider Marvel Cinematic Universe? No, you know, I, 
I was there sort of consigliere for a while and, and like had my consigliere, did you say? Yeah. Oh, what a, was, is that, do you think that's representative of how Marvel is run then as the consigliere? <laughs> um, we do not discuss our thing. <laughs> but, um, uh, but um, you know, I sort of had my finger in all of the films, you know, in the second phase, and uh, but you know, then I just had to concentrate only on on Ultron and sort of know that I, when it was done, I was just going to stop. So I made a completely clean break, not because you know we had a falling out, just because I was like, I can't just because if I was still there, going, well, here are my thoughts on this film, I'd be there every day. I you know, wouldn't do anything else because there's a lot of films and it's a lot of fun. It's very seductive when you can just, when you, you can sort of just put a little fairy dust on things, just improve them slightly and they actually listen to you. And you, it's, uh, it's, you know, I was a script doctor for a long time and the part where they listen to you was very rare. So it was important for me to, for my own self, just go, nope, um, we can still be friends. <laughs> but. Um, but you spoke about Shields. Um, and it was reported earlier this year that you regretted bringing Phil Coulson back uh, from the dead to defer, further develop the characters and agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. as it took some punch out of his death. Do you regret it or is it something you see as necessary and interesting move? Um, you know who loved hearing that was Clark Gregg. <laughs> <laughs> he was super thrilled. Um, I, uh, I, I think... I do think that there is an element of, for somebody who, you know, consumes all the Marvel product that it might take the punch out, but generally I feel like the S.H.I.E.L.D. audience and the, uh, you know, the Avengers audiences are not actually the same group necessarily. And no, I don't regret bringing back Phil Coulson because he's, he's, because he's Clark Gregg and he's so badass. <laughs> um, that was an aspect of it that became, you know, a, a a headline in the internet because that's what they do. I'm sort of, oh, that seems like the meanest thing he's said. Let's use that. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I think in, you have to go. Well, okay, if you take it back in TV, does it mean you took it back in film? And that was the thing. Was like because he came from why isn't he in the second film? I'm like because I have time to explain that. <laughs> it's like in addition to introducing 19 new characters, this guy's alive again. <laughs> so um, I couldn't do that. So it's an aspect of it, but it's a it's a small one. It's not uh, it's not how I feel about it. Do you think perhaps that TV has overtaken film as the main medium these days? Um, well, it, I mean, I'm not sure what you mean by the main medium, but my answer would probably be yes. Only in the sense that um, I think if, I used to describe most TV as comfort food, where you always knew what you were getting, and every week, you know, Jessica Fletcher would kill someone and pretend somebody else did it. And, um, uh, and then TV got much more textured and much more dark, and at the same time, movies have become more formulaic. And not just, that, not just movies, but the way we understand, the way we consume movies has changed. Um, besides the franchises, wherein you know, well, Jennifer Lawrence is coming back, because there's three more of these things. Um, uh, and that obviously applies to the Marvel Universe and DC and all that. There's also... Um, you know, every trailer, every trailer is pretty much every film. Every, everybody goes in knowing every rating, every, you know, we, we're all insiders now and, and we go to the movies for a particular thing um, and, to, and then we get exactly that thing. The era of sort of going to the theater and finding out what's playing when you get there is long gone. Um, and the era of, you know, the sort of bigger sort of weird 70s movies where you really didn't know what to expect tonally going in is also long gone. Um, and uh, so I feel like the two have switched places. Now in a TV show, the main character could be killed off. People will do that now. They're just, they're, you know, a little more fearless and a lot of the shows don't run for as long and so they're not built in the same way. Um, whereas the films, the, you know, the big films, it's, it's kind of switched. <laughs> Uh, many people ascribe the success of your ensemble-based projects, you know, Buffy, Avengers, for example, to your undeniable skill at weaving together convincing and engrossing group character dynamics. Uh, would you agree? Totally. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So what do you think the, the secret... I, I thought that would be the answer. So what, what do you think is the secret to getting a team story right? For me, um, it's, it's, 
everybody is the hero. Every character is the main character. And, um, you know, when anybody is on screen, you should go, oh, the story's about them. And then the next guy comes and goes, no, it's about them. Um, and that, you know, when I did Much Ado About Nothing, somebody said, well, this is so different than doing The Avengers. I'm like, not really, because, you know, I'm basically figuring out, you know, Margaret the Maid's arc and why, why would I ask Ashley Johnson, who's an amazing actress who works all the time, to come and play Margaret the Maid in, in uh, which is not a coveted role in uh, Much Ado About Nothing. What's, what's awesome about her? In the same way that I would say, well, how do I get a bow and arrow guy to matter in a movie with Thor and the Hulk in it? It's sort of everybody's got to have, they've got to have their own moment. Every time, you know, I put the lens on somebody, I'm in love with them. And every time I write somebody, I'm in love with them. And and that also makes for what's important about a group dynamic, which is that everybody's opinion matters. Um, everybody has a counterpoint to what somebody else has, and a counter view. And you know, I've seen one of the greatest sins, you know, for me, and not that I've never committed it because I have, is when you see when somebody speaks just to set somebody else up for their awesome line, and instead of like giving something that is e of equal weight and then having it topped. Um, and, uh, um, you know, and I, I think if you understand that you, that you, and this applies to day players and, you know, recurrings and anybody who might be in there at all, you just, if you're not getting the best out of them and giving them the best, then, um, you know, do you have a right to even ask them there? So I think that's... I should shut up. I should just end sentences. <laughs> Um, and after your experiences with Much Ado, would you ever direct in the theatre? I'd like to. Um, it's such a different skill set, and I've never done it. Um, with the exception of one, just a benefit, I wrote for Equality Now. Um, I, I had written some pieces for it that were being acted out, and I was sort of overseeing it as a producer. And then... Uh, I got some actors together, and there were readings, and there were scenes, and there were I mean, there was music, and it was just a little you know variety benefit. And then I got to the theater on the day of in New York, and uh, after about forty five minutes of waiting for the director to show up, went, "Oh shit, it's me!" <laughs> and uh, so, but that was like minimal. And uh, but really, I've never directed theater beyond that. So I would, I you know. Obviously, the thing I haven't done is the most interesting to me. Um, so yes, I'd love to, but uh, I can't promise I'd be any good at it. I mean, how did you settle on March Ado? I mean, is it your favorite Shakespeare play, or is it just? Uh, it's up there. It's not my very favorite, um, but it is. Uh, it's one that we always talked about doing because um, we knew Amy and Alexis should definitely be Beatrice and Benedict, and um, and it's all in one place. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, sort of low stress. But for years, I just didn't have a take on the material. And then finally, um, when I realized I did, I said, okay, it's go time. Um, and that really, that movie exists because of years and years of working with actors that I absolutely knew could do that as though it were live theater. Could walk on set and never get it wrong, and because we, you know, the schedule was exactly the same as a TV show. Um, no, actually, it was worse, and uh, it was actually tighter than than uh, a regular network TV show, and um, uh, and you know, obviously the language is slightly different, and no stage directions practically, so it was like a shit ton of work every day, and you can only do that when you know you have an ensemble who is, you know, just strength to strength. So it's really. Them. They're, they're my secret. I mean, I'm my secret. <laughs> it's, how, it's about me. So, so what is your favorite Shakespeare play, then? Oh, it's Hamlet. Is it? Please. Do you identify? I'm the whiniest person <laughs> besides Hamlet that I've ever known. It sounds like you've got your own take on that already, then, so look forward to seeing actually. that. Then. I do, and it's very dark. <laughs> Even for Hamlet. <laughs> So we're going to see Joss Whedon's Hamlet starring Joss Whedon as Hamlet sometime soon. <laughs> um, did I ever read Hamlet in my living room? Uh, I did. 
I did. I waited a long time with the Shakespeare readings. I was very gracious. I carried a lot of spears, but that was part of the devil's bargain was one day <laughs> after, you know, about a year of, of doing them, I got to read Hamlet. Um, and uh, Amy was my Ophelia, Alexis was Claudius, and um, Tony Head was my father, the ghost, which was great, because he had to leave. He's like, I have to leave early. So if, you know, you don't get to my, that, my second scene when you're, you're with the mum, then, um, you know, just somebody else can, can step in for me. What happened was, uh, he was there, and, he, you know, and then I'm like, Look, don't, you don't see him. Look as he goes. And he went, and then he went up the yard, and he kept, we could see him go out the window. He got in his car, and he drove away. <laughs> it was a perfect experience. Um, but yeah, my, I'm happy to say that whatever Hamlet I make will not star me. Okay. Well, I was about to say, when Serene McKellen came, he gave us a uh, soliloquy. So if you fancy taking the floor at some point, let me know, and I'm, I I'm sure we can stop the interview. I don't want to embarrass him. <laughs> That's what he said as well. Um, so it's hard not to ask about Firefly, um, but with the current trend of internet-based syndication on Netflix and Amazon, do you hope to see a return to that world on, the, on small screen, perhaps through a streaming service? I mean, look at Prison Break, for example. It's being revived because of the huge popularity on Netflix. You know, um, yes and no. I mean, I definitely love those guys, and they could absolutely all step right back into those roles. I a little bit would like to the security of having created some new things because again it's been a while since I've done that um, and again not writing the, the grand ensemble I'm also very afraid of what I call the monkey's paw um, and the monkey's paw is a wonderful story um, where they get the paw and it's awful and they wish for a thousand dollars and then how many people know this story the monkey's paw all right so uh, it's an older couple, they get the monkey's paw, they get three wishes, they wish for a thousand dollars, their son dies in a mining accident, um, they get a thousand dollars in compensation, um, they wish for their son to come back, and as he's shambling towards the door, uh, they wish that he was dead again. Um, because what's coming back is not good. And that's how I feel about a lot of these revivals. Um, even if they're great, there's something that is gone, something that is not there. Uh, the soul does not shine through their eyes, and, it's, and it's, it would be the worst thing I could do to Firefly. If I wasn't 100% sure that I could pull it off, um, then, then I've no business trying. So I'm tentative. Fair enough. So this is the last question for me before opening it up to the audience. And, and well, I haven't covered everything. That's for you guys to help me out with. But in 2004, you had a fantastic run with the Astonishing X-Men comics. Um, you've also been involved in Firefly and Buffy-related comic, comics as well as Frey, of course. Uh, you recently announced a new comic book project, Twist. Uh, what themes and influences from these earlier works do you think you'll pick up on? And is the comic book uh, a medium you could ever see yourself walking away from? Well, I mean, you know, the thing about comic books is you can do them on the side, which is, you know, so you, you, they don't, you know, put you to a dead stop. Um, Twist is not a giant leap forward in the sense that it touches on most of the things that I care about, which are feminism and people punching each other. Um, in direct relation to each other? Or? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's, it's just sort of a story I had stuck in my head for a while that I thought, oh, I'll do this. It's been put on hold a bit um, uh, while I figure out stuff at the company, but, um, but anybody who read it would go, oh, yeah, that's Joss. It's not, uh, it's not, it's not um, terribly surprising, although I hope it will be fresh. Um, and it's Victorian, which is just fun for me because I want everything secretly to be a little princess. <laughs> but with punching. <laughs> Well, don't we all? Um, so, uh, if you w I want to ask a question, please put your hand high in the air and then wait for someone to come around with a microphone. So, as I thought, lots of questions. So, we'll go with the uh, lady in the glass in the front row in the, in the black jumper. Yeah, you there, if you want to stand up. Yeah, there we go. Uh, do you have any plans to make a large musical? Not a, as in uh, four, two hours, like... Yes. <laughs> um, 
more I cannot say. <laughs> but yes. Can we get a rendition? No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, thank you very much for your question. Um, can we go right here at the front, the lady with the hand up in the front row, just here. Thank you very much. Um, you said that it'd be too tricky to re-erect Firefly as it was, but would it be possible to cre maybe create a similar show within the same universe? So you, you're not trying to resurrect the same characters, but you're building new characters within the same kind of world. Would yeah. that be safer? Um, it would. I mean, it's kind of... It's a version of doing that, of resurrecting it, because as soon as I start thinking about any of it, I'm like, what if we had all of it? Um, but yeah, I actually had an entire spin-off figured out um, while I was, you know, in my desperate uh, misery when it, when it was all canceled. Um, but uh, um, again, that's sort of in the same vein of just like, well, it is revisiting, and what if, you know, it's, it's the weak sister. In case you didn't realise that I think everyone really wants Firefly or something like that back. I don't no, know. Not, uh, I wasn't. Sit down I wasn't, if you agree. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for your question. We'll go to the, uh, in the green top there, to the second row back. Yeah, you, the person should look behind you. Yeah. Um, how, how do you think writing Buffy herself has informed the characterization of Black Widow? Um, well, I mean, Black, you know, it's, it's give and take. Black Widow existed before there was Buffy, although, you know, she got much tougher and cooler um, later on. I think that uh, Buffy was a character that I, I needed to write partially because she didn't, because it was an origin story. Even though the series took place after she knew her origin, it was still like an origin story. It was still about somebody finding out who she is and what she's capable of. Whereas Black Widow, I would think, is, was somebody who would have more in common with Mal than she would with Buffy. Um, uh, it doesn't hurt to have written um, uh, a female action star, and it doesn't hurt to have had somebody get pregnant while you're shooting them. Um, <laughs> because uh, that experience uh, will teach you much. Um, but really, I think they, they are, there are two things that I tend to write about, and they really are sort of, you know, the river mal dichotomy, where, you know, the idea of the journey to power, and then the idea of the burden of power. And, um, and I think uh, Black Widow falls more in the second category. Thank you for your question. Uh, can we go for the gentleman in the grey t-shirt in the second row here? Uh, talking of revivals and resurrections, what are your reactions and feelings to Neil Blomkamp's Alien, if it ever gets created, and Prometheus? Um, well, I, you know, we all loved Prometheus, but um, <laughs> I... Did I say that or think it? Um, <laughs> I, uh, I'd, I'd love to see what Blomkamp did with it. He's, it's been put on hold, hasn't it? Um, Prometheus did not, uh, did not all gel for me. Um, and, uh, but, you know, if uh, Michael Fassbender and Ridley Scott want to make a movie together, that's fine. <laughs> you could go right ahead and do that. How political of you right there. Thanks for your question. Um, if we go for, uh, let's go in the red top there. Yeah, the, the young lady. If you could stand up just to make it easier for the personal microphone. Thank you very much. Hello, is there a character that you've had a hand in creating that you feel a personal connection to in regards to like attitudes or anything like that? All of them. <laughs> I mean, no, and I'm not, I mean all of them. I mean every single one. I mean that you can't write somebody that you don't understand. Um, and I mean, they really are sort of, you know, your own mirror cracked. They are absolutely all shards of you. I think, I was surprised to learn about three years after, or maybe more, after uh, the Buffy series had ended that, uh, that I was Buffy. <laughs> um, thought I was Xander. <laughs> uh, which I also was, but more than I realized. Um, I definitely think um, I identified with Ultron enormously. <laughs> Um, cause he's just right. <laughs> and he's fucking nuts. So, um, 
But yeah, every, every single one of them has to have something. You know, even Riley, who, you know, went to church and was upstanding and decent, and there's, you know, there's that, you know, he's like a Steve Rogers. There's, you, you know, I love that character. I love the very small part of me that's decent and upstanding. <laughs> and um, so, you know, it's, it's uh, you have to find yourself in everyone. Well, the resemblance to Sarah Michelle Gellar's on canon, so, you know, that, see that. Thank you very much for your question. Um, if we can stay at the back, uh, right at the back there, the lady, I believe you're wearing glasses. My eyesight's terrible. If you stand up to make it easier. Yep, Harrison, just over there. Thank you. Um, what's your most favourite among everything you've ever made? My most favourite? Among everything you've ever made. Wow. I know it's a lot. <laughs> I love all my children. <laughs> Um, I did say earlier, and I think it's true, that I think the body may be the best thing I've ever done. Um, I think I connected with something there that went further than I knew it was going to. Um, but uh, after that, I don't think I could pick. I mean, favorite? I mean, I really... I really loved the, the run I did on uh, Brian K. Vaughan's Runaways book, um, which nobody cares about. So I, um, uh, I, you know, I really do, I do, I love them all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Sophie's question. <laughs> uh, if we come right down here, Naomi, just to the, the lady in the blue jumper. But how will I know if she's a fan? <laughs> <laughs> you have to guess. Um, I wanted to know, if you could go into any storytelling medium that you haven't gone into before, regardless of money, experience, anything from clay animation to aerial ballet, what would you go into? Um, uh, I do... Um, there is... I would... <laughs> Sorry. This is, there's no reason for me to be stumbling so much. Um, there is a ballet. Uh, that I conceived that I would very much like to direct, um, uh, that is meant for the stage. Uh, and that's def that ticks a lot of boxes. You say you relate to everything you create. You're also a ballet dancer deep down as well. <laughs> you don't want to see me when I'm alone in my living room. <laughs> but I am on point. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Um, if we go to the lady in the glasses there. Yeah, if you could stand up to make it easier for Naomi. Um, so a lot has been kind of said about how much stress it is on the creatives to keep the like synergy of the MCU while they're trying to make their own unique work. So I kind of have two questions. So like, while Avengers 2 was in production, I think that's when X-Men Days of Future Past must have come out at some point. So did you see that and seeing that Quicksilver, does it like, do you not, do you choose not to see the other stuff so it doesn't like affect your viewership, or do you have to see the other stuff? Um, I mean, that Quicksilver wasn't part of the MCU, but do you choose to not watch that so it doesn't affect your version of Quicksilver? And also, sorry, <laughs> do you watch stuff like the um, There's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but like the Netflix show, the Daredevil show, do you see that kind of stuff, like for your own personal viewership, or to affect how you dealt with stuff like the Avengers? And are you looking forward to Jessica Jones and Luke Cage? Because I am. <laughs> Um, it's a good thing we've got about 20 minutes left, so it's going to take your time. Um, in terms of the Quicksilver stuff, we did all, I didn't see the film, but I did watch the sequence um, because we all wanted to make sure that we weren't going for the same thing, basically. Um, and, uh, um, uh, you know, and I thought that sequence was terrific. The outfit? <laughs> um, but, you know, they, they, you know, they did more with it than... Uh, than we did, and it was what they did was very cool. Um, and so we wanted to see, you know, we sort of, you know, you, when you're making a film, especially over a period of time, 19 films will come out that are doing exactly the same thing you are. Not as specifically as that one. That was kind of a real blow. That was like, oh dear. But, um, uh, but you know, every Transformers and every Fast and Furious, like, oh wait, that was, oh, that's too much, we're, it's too similar. And then some indie film for Sundance, you're like, oh, well, that's exactly what we're doing, and you panic the entire time, and then, it's all fine, it's all different. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, with the TV show, you just have to, uh, you know, you just, you just have to be careful, which unfortunately just means the TV show gets, you know, 
gets leftovers because they're like, you know, one of the first things they said was, oh, we've got a great idea, we'll use Loki's scepter. So I'm like, yeah, <laughs> hold that thought. Um, and so it's, you know, it, it actually makes it, it is, makes it a little trickier, but they are separate enough that we're not, it's not in a panic. Um, yeah, you, you gotta keep your eyes open, but at the same time, your head down, because yeah, ultimately, you're not gonna make the same thing as somebody else. It's only when you happen to be making both that you really need to pay attention. Thank you for your question. Um, if we could go to the gentleman in the red coat, right up against the wall, there. So how do you feel about having to shoehorn in references to other MCU films when it is your own work? In particular, reference to the city. We it depends. It sometimes it's sometimes it's a delight, and sometimes it's a chore. I mean, you know, the, there was definitely an element of, well, you know, I want this film to be a closed loop, and I want this film to feel like you could that would be it. We're done, and uh, and instead, everyone was like, "What a great setup." Mm -hmm. Okay, that's two years of my life for a great setup. Um, and so, you know, it, it is a little frustrating and I think it's a, it is a little limiting, but, I, you know, again, if it's not affecting, if I get to tell the story that I set out to tell, um, and I did, then it's not really a problem for me. I mean, ultimately, the biggest thing is I wanted to say, the Avengers are changing. These guys are moving on. Will they come back? please. Um, but if for some reason they don't, if for some reason there's not another movie or whatever, um, you would understand. You would feel a sense, okay, the first thing was about building a team. The second one was about breaking a team apart. And that's particular to the Avengers, that sort of change. So um, in a way, inevitably it would feel like a lead into something because, oh, look at all these characters. Um, uh, but for me, the heart of it wasn't in the fact of the new people. It wasn't the fact of who the new people were. It was the fact of them, that our guys were moving on and that another generation would come. And um, uh, so it, it didn't derail the movie, but every now and then um, it is a little annoying. Thank you for your question. Uh, so we'll move across now. Uh, I believe there's someone in a purple jacket. Yeah, there we go. Go right here, Harrison. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, what do you think has been the biggest um, impact made by the internet on the industry you work in? I'm sorry, the biggest impact? Of the internet on the industry. I'm not aware of that. What is that? <laughs> um, you know, there, that question spans over decades in the sense that, you know, the Buffy community was one of the first really largely known cohesive sort of internet fandoms and, uh, and wherein we could have a dialogue about what was going on with the fans, and, and, uh, which was extraordinary. And, and we were very lucky because that was, you know, the ratings certainly weren't telling us that people were paying attention. It was, it was, it was the people on the internet. Um, now I think it's very different. I think it's, you know, it's um, a very double-edged and very sharp sword. Um, where you know people become so obsessed with internet presence or what's being said that uh, you know it's very easy to lose sight of of um, what you're trying to do or what you actually have done um, because there are so many voices and you know it's this weird thing where everything that happens is news everything is a headline every time I mean there was a an article about the trailer for Michael Bay's Benghazi film that just said what was in the trailer. The trailer had been out for months. And this was an article. And I read it thinking, oh, I want to see what they have to say about, about the film. They didn't have anything. They just listed the things in it. Um, and so was, there's this weird sort of microscope thing where you know, you, you, nobody's operating you know, under, the, under the radar anymore. And I think that's a little bit silly. And, um, and you know, it, it, ties into the whole thing about, you know, everybody knowing exactly what they're getting and seeing every trailer and getting every bit of information and leaking on set photos and, you know, you know, drive, you know the studios are all mad about security and, and it's frustrating for the artists working um, on some of these films. But at the same time, I understand why the studios are, are like that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it, it would be better 
you know, just if, if people could make things, you know, a little bit and then present them and go, look, here's this, uh, um, here's this uh, thing I made that you didn't know was coming. And, um, and it's, uh, it's kind of getting lost. And I think the internet has a lot to do with that. I mean, obviously there are many more effects because it's <laughs> the most significant thing that's happened. But those are the ones that have affected me. Is Buffy the show that people bring up to you most often, even now, or is it Probably something Firefly. else? Probably Firefly. <laughs> Firefly the most, and, and Buffy will be second. Um, what's exciting, though, is that you never know. Um, you never know. Uh, and uh, um, Dollhouse completely came and went, and then it appeared on Netflix, and then suddenly a lot of people had a very emotional reaction and connection to that show, which, um, you know, when we made it, we didn't, you know, we didn't get a sense of it all. Thank you. Um, let's go for. There's someone waving something. Um, it, yeah, the, the, the black is it black glove you're waving? There we go. Yeah. yeah. If you just yeah, get a microphone over to her, please. Hi. Um, so I, you've been very clear about your reluctance to turn any of your dearly departed projects into unholy revenants. Uh, which I completely understand. Um, but a few years ago, I remember reading that there was a completed script and even completed songs for a second Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog. And um, I was wondering if that was just a rumor or if there was any validity to that, and if so, what the status was. The st <laughs> ha. The status is um, uh, that it's in stasis. Um, uh, you know, everybody's very, very busy. Uh, Three of the writers had babies this year, as well as making movies and running TV shows. Um, actually, the only one who's available is me. Um, <laughs> but uh, we did come up with a plot about five minutes after we finished the first one, and, um, and we wrote several songs. Uh, and then it all just kind of ground to a halt, as these things do, where it remains. Um, I, I think we all intend to get back on that horse at some point, but... Um, uh, I have absolutely no idea when. So it was not just a rumor. There is not a completed script. That is so much, that is so much poppycock. Um, uh, but there are some very good songs. And a few crappy ones. <laughs> just, just talking about songs, so, you know, ranging from Buffy's angsty bronze soundtrack to Firefly's kind of Asian-tinged echoes of the old American West, music has always been a big character um, in your work. Who influences you, and what music do you personally enjoy? Well, obviously right now my entire life is about something called Hamilton, um, which is a Broadway show about our first treasury secretary in America. Kids love treasury secretaries. <laughs> so, it's a huge hit. It is. It's actually a monster hit, and it's the most brilliant thing I've seen in years. And um, I cannot get it out of my head, and it's ruined my life. Because um, I can't write anything of my own, because I just want to play that and sing along and listen to it. Um, but generally speaking, Broadway has been, you know, the biggest part of, of my life. And then, you know, sort of... I was very much of the, the sort of 70s folk rock stuff of the dead and Neil Young and the very, you know, and I loved country when it was, you know, for a while, it's the stuff that is very sort of grounded um, and, uh, you know, and kind of there's a structure to it and an ethos that I love that's very sort of hands-on and it's about the people who are playing. I love pop, obviously. <laughs> Tay Tay and I are like, <laughs> I'm in the squad. I'm waiting for my letter. Of acceptance to the squad, and he did now. But um, uh, and I do actually. She actually falls in that category of you know telling these little stories. I, I like her very much. Um, but uh, um, so it's you know I try to keep it as disparate as possible, um, so that it. But I don't know that I've necessarily found my own sound. Uh, I'm still lo I'm still looking for that. Um, and then I forgot. Was there a second part to that? Or was it just? Uh, no, that was it, basically. You, you, you've, you've done well. well uh, four marks. It, we're actually at the Union waiting for our invitation to Taylor Swift's squad as well, so if you, if you get any luck, let us know. Um, thank you for your question. Um, so there's a lady in a, a mustard jumper with, with glasses. Um, I was wondering why you chose to shoot Much Do About Nothing in black and white, and also 
I heard a story that in, in Out of Gas, Wash leaves Mal a big red button to call them back home once he fixes the ship. And apparently when Firefly got cancelled, Alan Tudyk came to your office and gave you the big red button to call them back if there were ever the film Serenity. Is that true? And do you still have the button? Um, uh, almost exactly, except that um, I, he did not give it to me because uh, I wasn't there when he stopped by. So he left it on my desk uh, with a note that just said, when your miracle comes, press this and we'll all come back. <laughs> and yes, I still have it. <laughs> um, and uh, I've completely forgotten the first part. <laughs> oh yeah, um, many reasons. Um, you know, I, I think of the film as, as a, a sort of noir comedy, um, and the ones I could think of examples all played in black and white. I felt it, it better suited our tone and would be better uh, for uh, differentiating it from the Brana, especially because that house and the, the sort of the hill and overlooks, it's, it's got a sort of almost a Tuscany feel. And you sort of want to, definitely don't want to go sun drenched in the same way, and, and I felt that, you know, my vision of it was literally darker, and, uh, and that it would be um, fun to play with. The other thing, equally important, um, was that uh, it's much easier and cheaper, because you can mix sunlight with artificial light and not worry about the color temperatures, which when we started to run out of one and had to use the other, we could. And you can also shoot across the street to, into a neighbor's lawn and not worry about a big orange you know, garbage bag or something, um, or you know, the, what colors your uh, actors are gonna bring when they bring the costumes that they all own because you couldn't afford any. <laughs> um, so it uh, was very practical uh, art. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Um, if we could go, yeah, right down here in the front row. Hi, Joss. Uh, I was wondering, what is it ab in, uh, about a story or a group of characters that makes it important to tell through the medium of a musical, apart from the ability to include lots of jazz hands? No, I think you've covered it, jazz hands. <laughs> um, I, I feel like a musical is the most perfect expression of what we are trying to accomplish, um, whether it's in singing or in dancing, um, to combine the emotionality. Whatever's most important in a musical should happen in whatever's best in, in a song. And that sort of hyperbolically emotional kind of grace is something we're all going for in whatever we're making. And in a musical, you can feel it, you know, from the roots of your hair down to your toes in a way that I just don't think anything else conveys. I feel like it is the ultimate art form. And um, so it's really, um, I, you know, it's, it's just a way of anything. I mean, obviously there are some things that just don't lend themselves to that um, because it is hard on its sleeve in a way that many things are not. But, uh, but for me, there is nothing, there is nothing greater than when you have that moment um, of connection and revelation, and somebody hits a high note. Was it hard convince? Was it hard to convince the Buffy ensemble to all get up and sing? Well, yes, some of them had a little problem with that. Uh, I I believe that I did drag Ali crying into my room to get uh, her range. Um, yeah, a few of them. Uh, objected so much. There was at one point I thought we were going to have to use an understudy for, for Buffy. Um, uh, but uh, a few of them, you know, like Tony Head, who'd done, you know, musicals and done chess and Rocky Horror and all that, he was, you know, they were game. And, you know, I give huge props to Nick Brendan because he had no musical training of any, and he's like, sure! <laughs> and you can see in, in the show, he's my favorite thing because he's like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm doing it. <laughs> and that's, that's beautiful. That's the best. Um, and everybody, you know, once they finally resolve themselves, oh, I, I actually have to do this. They, they came to play, they worked their hardest. Um, and uh, um, 
But yeah, definitely some people were like, ah, why would you do this to us? <laughs> and actually, I did it to them because of the Shakespeare readings, because the first Shakespeare reading was, um, uh, I think it was much ado, actually. Um, but it was, uh, we were all so terrified that we got so drunk. <laughs> and, um, and then afterwards, start, I sat down at the piano, and I was like, Tony, sing. And he sang, and suddenly everybody sang. And I was like, they can all sing. I should write a musical. <laughs> um, so it all, it's all connected to their fear. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Um, let's move towards the back, I think. So there's uh, a gentleman in the grey jumper, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, not in terms of kind of reboot or revamp or whatever, but if you were making Buffy now, is there anything thematically or in yeah, today's world that you particularly want to hit on? Yeah, I think it would be interesting for Buffy to experience extreme old age. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, like, I think she should have knee problems. <laughs> Kids love knee problems. Um, honestly, I wouldn't know till I started, I think. Uh, the thing about Buffy is that it was, in some ways, tethered, but in most ways freed by its mandate, which was every episode had to be, what would happen next in your life? What is the next thing you remember experiencing? Um, so I would sort of have to meet her you know, where she is now, and say, okay, well, where, what stage is she at, and, and, and what is that like? I know that every stage of my life has been me going, I don't know how to do this! <laughs> so I feel like there would be material, but, uh, um, you know, the, the thing about all of my stuff is that it's, it's always about personal politics. Um, I have, you know, very clear political bent and political ideas, but I'm not, I'm not, into discussing events. Somebody mentioned, talked about, you know, my opinions, and I think, you know, you're dealing with themes more than you're dealing with opinions. And, and so uh, there, I wouldn't want to sort of say, well, what's going on in the political landscape? Let's talk about that. I would say, what is it like when you're at this age? Um, and then I'd have to figure out what age she'd be now. Um, anybody know? Uh, so it's, it's, I know that's a non-answer, but it's because the show is built in the way that like, we'd have to sit down and go, okay, let's all talk about how we felt then, at this time. And I you know, have to remember. Thank you for your question. We've got time for a few more questions. Um, so we'll come down here, the gentleman in the black jacket, in the front row here. Uh, one of the things I really liked about Dollhouse was seeing actors take on a different role in each episode, and then particularly actors taking on each other's characters. I was just wondering if there's a, a trick to directing that or something particularly funny about directing that. Um, well, the trick to having somebody else play somebody else's role is to get Enver Jokai, because uh, he can do anything. Um, uh, apart from that, you know, I'm, the mutability of identity is something that fascinates me, and, and, uh, and you always want to give your actors something new to do. Otherwise, you know, they will become stale and crabby. Uh, but the, I don't have a trick for it. Um, you know, I do, I do very little teaching. I mean, you know, I, uh, I think it actually was, it's been said, my brother told me, he heard it from Ben Affleck, which is, you know, 90% of directing is casting. And, um, you know, you find people that you know can, can do the thing. There have been a few times when I have actually helped somebody and brought them forward. But I tend to just find little prodigies like Summer Glau who can already do all of it and go, great, I'm taking credit for that. <laughs> um, so I can't, really, I can't really say I'm not, uh, my, the only language that I have with actors is, is um, clarity and trust. I can be clear about what I need and they know that they are safe to go as far as they need to to find that and that only the best thing they do will ever be appear on film. Thank you for your question. Um, if we can go to, okay, there's someone waving. Um, the, the, uh, yeah, the, the person who's waving, still waving. Do you want to stand up? <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Hi, I'm really excited, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> so I want to ask that because part of your jobs involve proposing new ideas, but sometimes your ideas get turned down, or sometimes when you work really hard on a movie and st still there will be a lot of there will be some criticism. There will always be criticism from some people. So I want to ask personally, how would you cope with that? And also, hell Hydra. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I don't recall any criticism. I think. <laughs> I've, you know, I've been waiting for the backlash for my entire career. I thought with Angel, they're gonna just, they're gonna bitch slap me. They gave me pass on Buffy. They really love Buffy. Now this new one, they're just gonna be like, well, he's really. And then, and then, and then they didn't. And then, even with Dollhouse, which was not a hit, and a lot of fans were like, well, I know he's going for something. And I, oh, I support the effort, like you could tell, which is, you know, the sweetest way to say I don't get this or like it, um, that there is. Uh, you know, obviously, I think, uh, you know, Ultron has been the most uh, sort of complicated response I've gotten. And the way I deal with it is by becoming fetal for about eight months. I <laughs> fucking have no spine or self-identity or anything, and it's horrifying. <laughs> it sucks. Um, uh, but um, I'll be okay uh, later. Um, you know, in the process beforehand, when you're making something, when, when things are turned down, they don't work out, or somebody shoots them down, or somebody makes you change it, or doesn't deliver it the way you'd hoped, or you know, something doesn't come through. Uh, that, that is an experience um, of just endless rage. And, and it never goes away. Um, I am, you know, look at me, here I am. This is, I have, I have the most wonderful and, and luckiest career and, and, and I could tell my entire history just by rage. I could just take you through 25 years of fury and disappointment and if I'm like that, Imagine every other writer in TV and movies and every director. We all have things that we have swallowed, um, that we have dealt with, that we have just tried to, you know, compartmentalize or get rid of, or, you know, we all, we all have therapists, <laughs> sometimes more than a few. And, and um, I don't live by that. I don't have grudges. I'm not, I'm not here to settle the score. That's not the room tone for me. Um, but I can access it at any moment. Um, and every time, every single one of those disappointments makes me just as angry as it did um, the first time it happened. When I, my first great disappointment was the Buffy movie, and, um, and I was on set just stewing. And somebody said, well, can't you just grow up? Can't you just like get over it? And, uh, and even then, before I knew what I was in store for, um, being a working artist, I was like, no, I can't, and I don't think I'm supposed to. Because you cannot go you know, to your typewriter or your computer screen or your notepad thinking, here's something they'll get rid of. You can't, you can't think, this won't work. This will be badly done. This will be cut, poorly delivered, or, or, you know, or shelved, or whatever you know, terrible thing might happen to it. You, just, you have to believe every time that it's going to come out exactly the way it is in your head. And uh, so you have to be like that, you know, a, a punching bag doll. You have to just like be an inflatable guy, gets knocked back and then goes right back up and then gets knocked back and goes right back up. But it's not about naivete, it's about forcing yourself to be that guy, that creative guy who thinks everything's gonna be fine so that you can get through that page. I thought you were gonna go back to one of your favorite hobbies, punching people, as well as uh, the response. Well, it's really been a life of being punched more. Um, and. Uh, so I would, I would like to punch something, but I, I would not like it to be a person. Good to hear, good to hear. So there's time for one final question. Um, God, I've seen people stretch so much. Um, uh, I, I think we'll come down here to the gentleman in the, in the gray shirt. If you just stand up, sir. Thank you. Um, hi, Joss. It's an honor to have you here with us tonight. I was just wondering if you had an opinion on the fact that other film studios are looking at creating their own sort of shared cinematic universes such as we have Universal trying to do the Universal Monsters theory and they're talking about doing something for Transformers but the DC universe so I was wondering if you had a 
opinion on the fact that other studios are trying out the Marvel sort of model of establishing characters and then sort of interlinking them into other films. Do you believe this is a recurring thing we will see for the next couple of years or will it something that's just a phase? Um, you know, it's, it's hard to say. It, it, it depends on how it works out financially in terms of whether it'll stay. For me, um, I have both reactions. There's a part of me that says, you know, this is, it, it takes the, you know, it takes the soul out of a film if it's servicing so many other things that it isn't its own film. And sometimes when I, you know, I see, whether it's Marvel or DC or anyone, um, I see these attempts to sort of, well, they're trying to shoehorn this in with that. I feel a little bit like, ugh. I, I can see those cogs going and I can see the, you know, and it doesn't feel like I'm watching a film, it feels like I'm watching an agenda. Having said that, I grew up reading comic books, so I think it's awesome. <laughs> like, I saw the, I, I love the trailer for Suicide Squad. I'm like, oh, look at all them. And then it's tied into the thing, but it's not the thing. I get very excited about it, but I'm kind of an idiot. Um, <laughs> but you know, that, I mean, that connected storytelling is, is, it is, it can be very exciting. It can be, you know, was, making the Avengers was fun because it's like Thor is hanging out with Iron Man. What? That doesn't make any sense. It makes perfect sense to me. I read all the comic books where they did. Um, so, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I grew up with that and it, it gives me a particular thrill. But I do think that it is, it is complex, difficult to pull off. And if enough people crash and burn trying it, then it will go away. The question is, what will happen if it doesn't? Will films we were talking about before really turn into TV where it's just you know, tune in next week, which is my fear about how it works. Well, thank you everyone to ask questions, and Joss, thank you so much for coming oh, back. Yeah.